Colonel Jeremy Hansen. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. So you're going to be on Artemis II, and that is a mission to take humans further than they ever have been before. It's also laying the groundwork for Artemis III, which will then put boots on the moon for the first time since 1972. Have the significance of this moment sunk in for you yet? In some ways. I think, you know, I still have moments of realization where I kind of step back and I'm like, whoa, this is crazy what we're about to go do. Um, but in other ways, you know, it's been sitting with me for quite a while. I mean, I, I kind of phrase it differently. Canada is going on Artemis too, and I think that's an extraordinary story for our country. And uh, I've said it many times, it's very little to do with me, but it has a lot to do with visionary Canadians over decades who set big goals and figured out how do we leverage space to, you know, to make our country better, to serve mm -hmm. Canadians on, on the planet and create technologies and innovate, create jobs and share that with the international partnership. And Canada's earned this extraordinary opportunity to be the second country in the world to send a human into deep space. And I love that about this. I think it's an extraordinary reflection on what we have done in the past and what we're capable of doing in the future. When you talk about not just Canada, you think of some of the names, Mark Garneau, Roberta Bondar, Chris Hadfield, Steve McLean. You're the 10th Canadian to go into space. What does it mean to you? Personally, it's a life dream. I was inspired at an early age by space. I saw an image of humans standing on the moon, and I just thought, wow, that's extraordinary. I'd, I'd like to be a space explorer. And I've been really lucky when I look back upon it. I, I shared that goal with people, and people helped me. They supported me. They suggested um, you know, challenges I might take on to prepare myself, air cadet program, joining the military, and here I am today. So it's a dream come true for me, um, but I you know, I, when you mention those names, like I, I know them, I've met those people, of course, um, and, and they are the faces we put against those missions, but I've also met the people behind mm -hmm. those individuals that made this possible, and all these unsung heroes that we have. Space is tough, it's challenging, brings out the best in humanity, and uh, these teams deserve to be celebrated for what they've done. Part of the mission, there's a geological part to it, observing yeah. the moon uh, as you fly around behind the dark side of the moon. You've said in the past that it's something that can be uniquely performed by the human eye, some of this observation. Tell us a little bit about that. I was a bit skeptical at first, but the geologists have convinced me that uh, you know, we might bring some important observations to science. And so we have amazing imagery of the moon. We have these satellites that are orbiting it all the time, and we have really good high resolution imagery. But uh, we will have a different perspective, a different vantage point, and we'll fly around the far side of the moon and uh, the human eye is just a, a miraculous instrument and it can see things that these instruments don't see different spectrums and our brains really adept at picking out things that are strange and different and so human eyes have never seen most of the far side of the moon just because of during apollo they always wanted light on the near side for the landings and so it was always dark on the far side and so we're hoping our trajectory our launch date will support us seeing parts of the moon that have never been seen by human eyes and we might just pick up a few things like different shades of a region that they're like there's something weird here that we need to investigate further. Talk to me a little bit about how you guys, uh, the astronauts, are actually going to be tested up there as well. You're being tested right now. You're wearing uh, this sort of uh, device on your uh, a watch-like device that is already tracking things. Why is that important to track? Well, we, you know, we've been collecting medical data on astronauts since the very beginning, and we just don't have a lot of humans that have flown in space in general, even fewer that have flown out into deep space. That's a different radiation environment. And so, yeah, we collect data on all of us. It's, it can get a little bit tiring, <laughs> all the data collection <laughs> that's going on before we fly. And then uh, even during the mission, we're flying some like replicas of our, our human cells. And so they've been collecting this, this, these cells and they're gonna culture them and they'll keep them alive. And so there'll be the real version of Jeremy on the spacecraft <laughs> and then there'll be this other version of Jeremy that's there. But that's really interesting science because if, when we get back, they'll compare the two and is, is the chip version of Jeremy the same as the real version and if it is if the if the results are the same then we could fly thousands of people to space and collect data on chips mm -hmm. without having to send all the people so that's really neat science I want to take a, a bit of a wider view which is almost funny to say to somebody who is going uh, to space when you consider how much of this space race is going on right now Canada's role is an important one 
Are you at all concerned that we have heard from the U.S. administration that they're looking at possibly making cuts of upwards of 24 um, percent uh, to the budget of NASA? Are you concerned about future missions going forward and, and something that you're really pushing forward right now because you're setting the table for Artemis III. Are you concerned that NASA may not be uh, at the table as much in the future? Um, well, I've, there's different ways to look at that. I, I, I believe in, in the end, at the end of the day, you know, that what has driven us to this point to take on these big challenges, it's, that drive is still going to be there. We're always going to question the dollars and cents of things, and I think that's healthy. Um, a little bit of debate is, there's nothing wrong with that. So I guess I don't rest in concern, but I know that it's always, it, it has always been hard fought when you're doing visionary things. It's mm -hmm. always going to be challenged, always has been, it always will be, it's just sort of par for the course. Um, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer in you know, science. Um, I think the ripple effects of that and the innovation that comes from setting big goals and then bringing a collaboration together to solve them. Like I, I live it every day, I see it, it's extraordinary what people come up with mm -hmm. um, and when they have like this common vision and they just refuse to fail I mean they have failures along the way but they refuse to give up and they go until they solve it I see the rewards of that so I'll always be an advocate for it and I'll anyone that's willing to listen I'll spend time explaining some of those you know wins that I've seen earliest possible launch date is somewhere in early February uh, we've heard that you've already rehearsed the goodbye with your family a couple of times <laughs> yeah. when is the real thing though how difficult will that be for you? So I think the, you know, the, the day of launch is, you know, very scripted, you know, wake up on the minute and all these things we go through to get to the pad and strapped in and we will wave goodbye to our families um, and, you know, a very quick goodbye, a very quick public goodbye that you'll be able to watch on TV. Uh, but the real goodbye will be the day before. You know, my, my family, our goal is that we'll all be in quarantine together so that I can actually see them and give each of them a hug and a kiss the day before. I, I think that'll be hard. Like when I kind of rehearse that in my brain, I'm like, ooh, that's, that's going to hit, hit a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, ultimately, like the reality is I'm very optimistic. I, I know there's a lot of risk in the mission and that things can go wrong and you have to prepare for that. I think I'm mentally prepared for that. I think my family understands that. But ultimately, I do believe the most likely outcome is we're all fine when we hit the Pacific Ocean nine and a half days later. And so um, hopefully we can just sort of lean into the excitement and compartmentalize that fear a little bit. I appreciate you taking the time. Mission Specialist for Artemis II, Jer Colonel Jeremy Hansen. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Mike.